Something else that I realized we didn't do last week, and, and maybe we should do this more often, but who are you? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't really introduce ourselves in our pilot episode. Uh, my name is Mike Cooley. Uh, I'm originally from Maine. That's where our podcast is uh, stationed. And uh, just been a long-time fan of Magic the Gathering. I've been playing since Mercedian Mass. Tell me I'm wrong, motherfuckers. Mercedian Mass. We just <laughs> lost our PG-13 rating. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We tell we tell YouTube this is not for kids. <laughs> but uh, I've been playing, you know, ever since then. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's like my buddy says, uh, you never stop playing Magic: The Gathering. You just stop having people to play with. Um, I've been in and out over the years, but it's mainly just because of where I've been at and the different situations. So, you know, always been a big fan of it, though. Yeah, right on. I I was a, an MMO player for years. My name's Brad O'Brien. I'm a transplant to Maine, and after playing MMOs for years, I knew that I wanted a hobby that actually got me out in front of other people. I found our uh, one of our friendly local game stores here, met some people that were quick to, to teach me the ropes and help me build decks and toss me a couple of cards, and uh, you know, now here I am. That was probably 2012, so seven years later. Uh, when I'm when I bought and moved into my new house, every person that came to help was somebody that I knew from the magic community. Absolutely, so, uh, it, meeting meeting people at game stores is single handedly. I think how I've gotten many many of my friends over like the past ten years. Yeah. I swear, I mean probably a good seventy five percent of them at least. Yeah, we uh, happen to have one one connection outside of that, <laughs> but but here we are having a podcast now. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. So thinking about fast bond and people going in on that. Reserve list stuff. That was that was clearly his game. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just it's one of those things where yeah it might, it might be a a blue chip blue chip stock that's always going to go up. But not a lot of people buy blue chip stocks. Right. Well, Force of Will isn't on the reserve list. No. No. But no, that was just it, yeah. But it's it's true. I mean, there's very few things in card games these days where you can say, yep, this is an investment. You know, reserve list is definitely one of those things. It's almost never a bad idea. Like, even if you were on the the back end of the, the dual land crash as of, of 2019, mm-hmm. and you bought dual, you know, like a Tundra at $350, $400 or something, and then now it's worth like 250 you know what I mean, $200, you can reasonably get them for like 180 you know, I still wouldn't feel bad about that. Like, yeah, okay, I spent 400 it's worth 180 now. Yeah, I got time on my side. You know what right. I mean? You're, you're, you're taking your lumps because eventually, just by, literally by the nature of its inability to be printed, even if it's just collectible and not played, it'll have value. Do you ever worry about that? Like, everybody talks about it every year that this is going to be the year that they kill magic or magic's going to die. Uh, I do worry about it. As uh, as the owner of a Black Lotus, I really worry about it because uh, that could, you know, I didn't spend a lot on my Black Lotus. Like, I mean, comparably, I spent a thousand bucks on it. But, like, it doesn't feel good that, you know, if suddenly it was worth a thousand dollars. Like, you know what I mean? And Or it was worth even less, let's say. Um, so... Yeah, I worry about that all the time, man. I used to buy those uh, the Chinese fakes, uh, and every every time that I would hear about a new style of fake cards and like a new way to do it, I would go out of my way and buy those cards. I'd seek them out because I just personally wanted to know, as an owner of a Black Lotus, like, can I tell the difference? You know what I mean? Like, if I mixed these together right here, would I be able to pull my Lotus out of it? And like. <laughs> So far, the answer to all of those has been no. Like, I've never seen a good fake. Like, I've seen some some uh, good rebacks for sure, but uh, I've never seen a I've never seen a good fake, like complete fake. So, but uh, it's it's definitely one of those things. Regardless, I think no matter how much they print the shit out of Magic, though, no matter how much they reprint stuff, no matter how much they say they're gonna kill Magic, do you think they will ever do away with the reserve list? I think 
No, I think something very drastic would have to happen for them to do it with the reserve list because I don't think that those cards matter to the to the majority of Magic players. The I don't even think we comprehend the difference between the enfranchised player like you and I that consume content and go to websites. Most Magic players, I mean, I, I would, from what I gather from Maro and people on Twitter, the majority of Magic players don't even necessarily know there is such a thing as a GP or a Magic Fest. Like, they pick up some cards at Walmart and go home and play with their friends on kitchen tables. Right. That is the majority of Magic players. So when I think about the, th the hundreds of people that I know through the game, and, and by proxy the thousands of people that we know sort of shared, and I go to events, if I go to a GP, those are all enfranchised players. Mm -hmm. If there's ten times that many people in the same Northeast region where I am that don't do those sort of things, that's a lot of players that are like, oh, this card's restricted? I don't know. Right. I've just had it. Or my dad, you know, this was in my dad's stuff. And Classic, you know, the tabletop player. I mean, that's true. You're always going to have those people. But you're, you know, the reason they would have ever said, hey, we're not going to print the shit out of these cards is because they know that they, they do have, there's people like us <laughs> yeah. out there who are like, you know what? I don't want these cards to be worth absolute nothing. You know what I mean? Um this is, but, but this is collectible, I, it should have value. It, my, my opinion on it is I think they have, in recent years, tried to break the rules on the reserve list. And I mean really gone to the point of blatantly crossing the line um, in a couple of different ways. Um, so first of all, you knew about the... Uh, I'm sure we've all heard about the, um, the From the Vault sets, the From the Vault Relics and From the Vault Exiled. Uh, those, of course, those were a number of years ago now, but that was the first time that they, they stepped over the line with the reprint list. And, uh, I saw it happen and I was cheering it on. I was just like, yes, go, you know, re reprint them. Who gives a shit? You know, but I saw them, I, I saw Karn Silver Golem and I was like, that's on the reserve list. Like you just reprinted that in foil. Like that's on the reserve list. And of course, Mox Diamond, you know, that's on the reserve list. They reprinted that. There was some big kickback in the community about that, and they said, "Okay, we are right. We won't we, even do it in we specialty won't. products." Yeah, but then you see shit like this. Like this is, you know, I was just over here searching on the iPad, right? Uh, you then you see them do shit like this. Okay, uh, deranged hermit on the reserve list. It's a, uh, it's a fifteen dollar card, um, and it says uh, five mana. It's two green, three colorless. It's an elf. 1-1, one, one, and it says all squirrels get plus one, plus one. When it comes into play, put four squirrel tokens into play. Treat them as 1-1 one, one green creatures, uh, and it has echo, right? So there's that. And then recently, in the new uh, one of the new commander sets, I believe they also reprinted it in, um, what was it, the Modern Masters set. Let's see, I think it, yes. This one right here. It's a Thelonite Hermit, as I believe is the one. Yeah. Uh, so Saverlines. Yep, there's this one. Um, for So so get this. Uh, this one just brings in the four. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, it does basically the same thing as Deranged Hermit for less mana, right? So it says uh, all Saverlings get plus one, plus one, which is a better class, honestly, for, you know, there's more creatures out there. There's more ways to generate saplings. Right, in black bordered magic, you're, you're going to see a lot more saplings and squirrels. Exactly. Um, and it comes into play and creates four 1-1 one, one green sapling creatures. Uh, it doesn't have Echo, which anyone who knows about the deranged hermit combo knows that Echo was very important with that combo back in the day. Um, however, I'm missing the card. It's called something different. It's from... Uh, the new Modern Masters, uh, or the new Modern Horizons set. Um, I'm going to forget the name of it, but uh, feel free to, to look it up while I'm talking. I can give you a pretty good description of it. But uh, it has the ability called Vanishing. So basically the same thing. Um, you, you know, the, the reason why Deranged Hermit was good back in the day is, and I mean way back in the day, this was a long time ago um, when, you know, you didn't have as, the power level of cards that you have now. Uh, there was a combo with Lifeline and Deranged Hermit. Uh, you know, Deranged Hermit has Echo. If you don't pay the Echo cost, you have to sacrifice it during your next upkeep. 
Well, there's a card called Lifeline, which I believe is on the reserved list as well. Um, it's a five drop artifact and it says whenever a creature dies, um, return it to the battlefield at end of turn if there is still a creature in play. So as long as there's some creature on the battlefield, any creature that died that turn comes right back into play. So what they would do is they just slam deranged hermit and lifeline and just keep getting four squirrels each turn. And it was really hard at that time, uh, you know, to deal with that creature. You know, a lot of people were loading their decks with, um, you know, creature removal, but that's exactly what they wanted. They just wanted you to kill the deranged hermit because it would come back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so they would have to sideboard in for hate against lifeline. You know, uh, but basically the new card is, it, it looks almost exactly like uh, Deranged Hermit. It's a five drop. It's two green, three colorless. Uh, it says, you know, it's a, a druid elf or something like that. Basically the same creature type. All squirrels get plus one, plus one. It's a one, one. Brings in four, and it has vanishing three. So it's practically the same card. Like they have, if you ask me, they've practically stepped over the line again. You know, they've, they've said, okay, we said that we won't reprint these. What happens if we reprint something that's very similar in form and function that only, and only slightly different? You know, uh, that card is, I don't believe is worth much at all. I mean, I can't even remember the name of it. I can't imagine many people play it. Um, but it was, it, it, it just looks and feels like Deranged Hermit. Um, so... Deep Forest Hermit. Yes. Hey, look, it even has Hermit in it. They're not even trying to hide it. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think they've done a lot of these callbacks. You know, uh, what's what's the guy's cradle that they printed? In yeah, there? Shrine to Nykthos, or Shrine to Nyx. Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx, yep. Uh, no, the, the flip card. Oh, from yeah. Ixalan. Yes. Uh... Yeah, I know what you're talking about. The uh, yeah, it's a flip card. It does exactly the same thing as yeah. Guys if you can get it to flip, you've got a reserve list card. Right, and it's it's not a challenging thing. And it's it's so we're before we started recording, we were talking about that. You know, here's a card. It's a fifty dollar foil, and it's a one dollar non foil. Eventually, people are that one dollar non foil. If if the card is played, is going to go up. Right. So. I, I'm, I'm not going to buy a guy's cradle, but I will play a. Uh... God damn, it's going to bug me that I can't remember the name of that card. Is it the is it the blue green one? I forget no, now. It's I just didn't play very much in this. Okay, but I get what you're saying though. All you have to do is flip it, and suddenly it's a guy's cradle. Yeah. Like what happens? You know, nobody made a big, big stink about that. I don't believe. Like there was there was no. I didn't hear of any uprisings about hey you just reprinted Gaia's Cradle so now alternatively what if they printed a land right for or even an artifact for zero and it just says at end of turn transform this and it's a friggin Gaia's Cradle you know what I mean it would in form and function be very similar to Gaia's Cradle different name and completely okay to reprint you know, it's sort of the same thing with, like, Black Lotus. Like, I think I have heard before that someone says they can't just print the exact same card with a, a different, different name. name. Yeah, yeah they, they can't do that. But, you know, what if they had a, a you know, Black Lotus-looking thing that they, you know, it's, you know, Suspend Zero or something. Or, like, you know, or Suspend... Mox Tantalite. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, what happens if it's like it's suspend so one or, you know, yeah. it, it's still pretty busted at that point. And, you know, granted, you can't in that in that sense, you can't dump it right down first turn. But like, what if they could? What if there's a way that they can do it? Some ability that they print, you know, if you have seven or more cards in your hand, you can play it for free or something like they could technically do that. You know, uh, I'm nerding out now just looking at growing rights of it. Lamach, which is a, a three drop. I think if you play a bunch of dorks, like you power, put this out on two, on 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 three, play another land. You got four mana. Your dude costs five. We gotta get your dude out after this. That plays four creatures right off the bat. Pass the pass the turn. Flip it over. Guy is cradle. Guy Jesus. Is cradle. Jesus, dude. But I mean, people are on to growing rights. Growing rights is is not necessarily a cheap card. Mm-hmm. 
And it's because people know the value of a cradle and they can't afford it. So all of these uh, ancestors, you know, that, that these are, are bad clones, however you want to look at it, of, of cards that are on the reserve list are certainly cards that people will play and spend money on. So growing rates right now, eight bucks, almost a nine dollar market price on TCG. No kidding. What set was that printed in? Exelon. Wow. I'm actually surprised that these bio boxes are that cheap. Twenty one twenty five. Twenty one twenty five. These all of these were pretty rare and gorgeous. Yeah. They, and they came in those little uh, plastics. The little plastic sleeves that wrapped them up. No, for for and especially for true true collectors that just want to have the cards that aren't even concerned about playing them. If you have the whole set of these, it actually makes the Exelon map. No way. Yeah, the backs of all of the buy a box promos makes a map of Exelon, which was uh, the game day mat. Wow. So you can see sort of if you look at the game day mat, you'll see where these would line up on. It Lamont Cradle of the Sun. See, they know what they're doing. Hmm. Calling cradle. back, yeah, Cradle Hermit. Like they're yeah. they're really calling. They're it out. they're all callbacks. Yeah, and they're they're so uh, when you say, will they reprint these reserve list cards? I th I think, and and I am of the opinion that Pioneer is going to be the new L. Like they want that to be the large, long term format. They want that to, to, they want Legacy, and, and those people that are playing Legacy and Vintage will continue to do that because they're hardcore. Mm -hmm. But there are so many modern players, and, and I guess I don't know how many people were playing Vintage and Legacy at the time that Modern was created, but when they talk about the growth of the game in the last even 10 years, they talk about it as if it's exponential growth. And they talk about the printing of sets is more than ever, but card values are still profitable in the second market so there's enough people out there that even though they're printing 10 times or 20 times or 30 times as much product and putting them out five times more times a year yeah <laughs> like last year was crazy next year is going to be crazy with commander oh, product yeah. they're definitely winning out on that man like if you if you think about it whenever you buy i mean some people are really lucky with cracking booster packs but when you buy booster packs how often is it that you actually win out when you when you buy a pack? Like about as often as a lottery ticket. Pretty much, yeah, exactly. It's it's <laughs> it's basically a lottery ticket, man. Yeah. Like they know if they would profit more just by selling single cards, they'd sell single cards. You know what I mean? It makes more sense for them to you know to sell booster packs. They make way far more money off of them, and you know that's what I think when people cry that paper is dying. Paper is super profitable. Because here's the thing, you can dump money into Arena, and I'm sure some people do. I've been playing just fine for free. Yep. <laughs> and I think a lot of people that get into that kind of game just to try it are going to try and do it for free. Oh, exactly. I've never paid a dime on that game. You know, it's supporting wizards every day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've never paid a dime on it, but... Uh, you know, it, and you easily can. Like they, they are really they're tackling it hard. They know all about these little micro tra transactions. They're doing a great job with it. Um, there's still a big profit margin on that, but it's possible, like you said, to just not pay anything and get any card that you want. You know, uh, and also something that something that you know isn't talked about a lot in the in the paper versus digital debate is you know look at Magic Aids. Like the channel Magic Aids, yep. he got banned. Like he he got his account back. They eventually let him come back, but Wizards banned him just because they didn't like his name one day. Yep. That can happen. Like that stuff can happen. And then all that you've worked for, you lose. And heaven forbid, the person that got that kind of treatment and wasn't like a famous YouTuber or something might not have ever got their investment back. Might not have ever got any return on what they you know on what they spent their money on. Alternatively, you know if you. Aren't if, a douche. If you if you aren't <laughs> a douche, not, he's actually not a douche. He's just had an unfor unfortunate yeah. sense of humor when he named his channel, and then yeah. oh, his, exactly. His taste change for sure. I think with him specifically, his his whole style has changed based on that yeah. that event. You can tell he's a 
uh, he's a bit more cynical, I think, of Wizards and, you know, the way that he, he goes about doing what he does, yeah. you know, which I think is comical. Uh, you know, I'm, it's a definitely a marked change, though, since yeah. since that happened. But, you know, uh, what we were saying is if you invest in paper magic, people can't just take that away from you. Yeah. You know, as long as you reasonably protect it, it's yours. Yeah. You know, it's it's your property at that point. Well, and, and because so many people play this game far more casually than we do, because you can get that immediate gratification to walk into a CVS or a, a Walgreens or a Walmart or a Target or wherever and buy booster packs and get that lottery ticket feeling of, oh, I could, hey, I just cracked a foil crap rare. And that still gives you that excited feeling, even though it's not worth the three dollars you spent on the pack. You're like, "Oh, it's a foil! Yeah, I should buy another one." My, my luck's on tonight. Oh yeah. So we do a we did a great job in our uh, pilot podcast uh, last week talking yeah. about uh, potential cards to invest in, and you know potential cards to uh, to keep an eye on in the future. Um, have you seen some of the new leaks that are coming out for uh, the new set? I have. I've been all over Mythic Spoiler. Oh my god, man. Some of them are great. I'm sure uh, a lot of people have uh, already seen the combo um, with Walking Ballista and Heliod, which is really, really cool. I'd like um, Splinter Twin back. <laughs> In Modern, Pioneer, and Standard. Yes. Yes, I don't know if it's if it can be as quick as Splinter Twin. I say that, and then you watch. You know, things are gonna blow up. It's gonna get banned, and you know, it's gonna be twice as quick. I don't know. That's that's just me predicting things know. sometimes. Should we do the math? How how quickly can Heliod come down? So technically, three, four, five. Okay, so you need five mana. So I didn't play. I didn't play Splinter Twin. I bet you did. Uh, funny story, I had just built Splinter Twin for uh, for Modern, and then Splinter Twin got banned before I went to my first tournament. <laughs> I don't think that's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> paid, paid the full price, the 20 bucks, you know, per per Splinter Twin. I think they were like 25 at that point. Was feeling good. I said, man, I didn't really want to spend that 100 bucks, but I'm glad I did, because i got to keep up with the big boys. And sure enough, literally the next week, banned Splinter Twin, it went down to $5. It was... Uh, okay. So, we should probably talk about what this combo is. We're talking yes. about Helion Sun Crowned, two and a white, for a 5-5 five, five legendary enchantment creature god. They're bringing the gods back. Like usual, they are indestructible and are not a creature unless you've reached a certain devotion threshold, which for uh, Heliod here is five. Yep. And he says, whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. Um, and he also says, uh, pay two mana, a white and a colorless, another target creature gains lifelink until end of turn. So, why people are talking about that, uh, some, some people might already know, oh wow, that's really cool with Walking Ballista. It sure is. It's actually an infinite combo with Walking Ballista. Uh, because as soon as, you know, if you give Walking Ballista lifelink um, and it deals damage, you get a counter put on Walking Ballista, which you can then remove for free to deal a damage... Uh, yeah, and you know, counter. repeat the cycle. So, uh, technically, yes, this could technically be a turn three win, you know, or uh, I'm sorry, turn four win. Yeah. Because, or actually, depending on what moxes you slam out in Pioneer, like, you know, you could put a the, the new mox that gives you colors for legendary permanents, and technically, it could be a, a turn that's, three win. That's but. interesting, and I wonder if they, I wonder if they templated mox amber specifically. So that this isn't possible because Heliod isn't a creature until you've hit that threshold. I can tell you, I think I know how that would work. Um, because it's legendary creature or planeswalker. Ah! It's yep. not legendary permanent. Right, it, it, it wouldn't work. Um, it, Heliod, believe it or not, is actually a creature for a second when it comes into play. We figured this out in the last rotation. Um, it checks to see if it's a creature when it comes in. Uh, the the word as means uh, it's on it's in play when it checks. So as being the key word, it's on the battlefield for that you know momentary blink in time. It is a creature. 
but then as soon as it checks, it's no longer a creature. So if you have an effect that says, like, creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped, Heliod will enter the battlefield tapped whether he's a creature or not. Um, but anyway, so, side point. Yeah, side point, but um, I don't want to give it up. Uh, I play Pelt Collector. Play Heliod, is Pelt Collector, Pelt Collector going to get a counter? It should. Inquiring minds want yeah, to know. Yeah, it should. We should check that out. We should. We don't want to. We don't want to mislead people no, who might. No. Uh, uh, so like, we'll say. We can't say for certain, but it would, it's interesting to think about ETB effects. Do ETB effects see Heliod or any of the gods entering as a creature before they actually get checked? Right. So, I'm gonna check this out right now while we're talking. The cool thing about this is the combo with Walking Ballista is already getting played now with. Archangel of Thune, and four mana Soren from War of the Spark, where Soren says creatures you control have life link on your turn. Archangel of Thune says whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on each of your creatures. So, another, that's a three card combo. Everybody's excited about Helios, because we're talking about a two card combo. Multiple ETP triggers. We're doing some research on the fly here. Yep. Uh, so, te I mean, so you like Walking Ballista? Oh, absolutely. It's a pricey card. Yeah, I would still say it's a good investment right now, though. It's a uh, you know, it's a thirty dollar card right now. I saw them on online for twenty eight. Uh, that card went down to about twenty dollars, twenty or twenty one, um, and it's crept back up to twenty eight. I do not, by any means, think it's it's done climbing. Um, assuming it dodges a reprint anytime soon. Or um, or a ban, uh, like in Pioneer or something. Assuming that, right? They've they've said that they're going to dial down on bans. Assuming that that card is a fifty to sixty dollar card, hands down. It's uh, we, we were talking last week about uh, uh, precious two drops in each color, right? You know, you have your Snapcaster in blue, you have your Bob in black, and your Tarmogoyf in green. Um, the colorless, precious, you know, card at the two-drop spot is Walking Ballista for colorless, you know, for artifacts. Oh. There's there's never been anything printed better than it um, at the two-drop spot in straight colorless uh, that, it, you know, is is used in and as versatile as this card. Um, and it's just everything that a colorless card wants to be. Like, it's, it's everything you want to do in so many decks. It's an infinite mana outlet, you know, or uh, an infinite mana... Uh, mana sink, sink. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's uh, it's something to do with your infinite mana. It's um, just very versatile. It's extremely hard to deal with. You know, you can almost always choose basically what you want to happen. If someone right. path to exiles, you're your walking gonna, ballista. You're going to get the most profitable of the exchange. Exactly. Probably. Like it, it's so hard to profit off of that card when they just when someone destroys it. It has which pedigree is, in hardened scales and devoted devastation, devoted druid decks. Right, and I think right now, the reason why Walking Ballista hasn't gone through the roof and up to like 50 or $60 is because I think people are kind of being modest with this combo with Heliod. You know, they're thinking, okay, it's still like a turn four or turn five, you know, uh, kill. First of all, that's really good. Uh, but to to whoever would say that argument, to their point, it's also very interruptible. Someone could, you know, once they see Heliod come down, could, you know, decide to, you know, take a loss on dealing with Walking Ballista. You know, we were just talking about it's extremely hard to deal with and win out. You know, they could kind of cut their losses there. But at the same time, uh, I think people are... I, I'm not sure if people are giving it as much credit as it, as it deserves. Um, because Walking Ballista in and of itself is just a nasty card regardless of whether or not heliod is in with it and ever makes it to be a combo the card is just so good it's it's used in all four uh big formats right now eternal formats you have you know modern legacy vintage um well and i think that that's evident in the fact that it's a 25 i'm, um, I'm looking at it now and and saying okay you could get, i could get a second play set for 100 bucks yeah um and that might be worthwhile if you can double your money in six months. Um, if we were doing this podcast when uh, Walking Ballista was in Standard, I was saying this, you might have heard me say it at the shop, like, as soon as that card rotates out, 
hold, uh, give me all of them that you have. Me and Waldo were talking. I think you got my foil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was, I was saying like, you know, I want, I want all of the walking ballistas when it rotates out, just because there's certain cards that when they pop up, you you realize that is really good. Uh, mm -hmm. I did the same thing with Snapcaster when I was living in Atlanta. That was in standard. It rotated out, went down to like nineteen, twenty dollars, and I just went around trading for all of them. I was like, this card just seems really good. I've never seen a better blue card, you know, I'm like, this is, you know, I'm sure there are out there, but in my head, I'm like, this is just the best blue card ever, you know, uh, and I feel that same way about Walking Ballista. But, you know, now let's add the combo into it with Heliod, right? You can technically do it, technically, turn three. If you have, or, or turn four, I'm sorry, like with so, any sort of mana boost, right, all you need is uh, just some slight mana boost and you can give your walking ballista lifelink and if the boards if, if the board's clear you swing in for one after giving it lifelink you know uh connect get a counter shoot them to death yeah like it's just it, hey, yeah for those that are playing at home your ballista does need to have two counters on it to start the chain yeah exactly you couldn't just remove the one counter uh you know and and go nuts it wouldn't quite work like that but <laughs> you'd uh, be sad oh yeah but, I mean, I still think it might be possible to do it turn three. I, I can't think of it in my head right now, but, you know, let's assume uh, there's some sort of Mox, uh, Mox conundrum here. Is, is Mox, Mox Opal must be banned in Pioneer. Well, it's, it's not in the format. That's right, actually. Yeah, because yeah. it was printed too soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... So, but I mean, who's but to modern... Say, yeah, modern for sure it's possible, turn three. Yeah. Um, but who's to say in Pioneer an effect, you know, or, or a card that doesn't boost your mana like that, it won't be printed, you know what I mean? That, that boosts your mana almost equally as broken, you know, won't be printed. What if they print a mox in this set that's like, uh, you know, add a mana for, you know, equal to the a, a color of an enchantment you control? Like, you know, what if that's a thing? What if that gets, what if that happens in the past, you know, in the future even, even if it's not this set? Just, there's so many endless possibilities, I think, that over time, this combo will really be something to deal with. Uh, you know, uh, again, Walking Ballista in and of itself is just a nasty card. Well, you're talking about a card that was printed in the last five years, where where these sets have been printed and printed and printed, like printed probably more than than Magic sets for five, ten years before that. In total, you're talking about you know Wizards ramped up production, and and Maro talks about this on his blog how much more they're just literally printing more. That's probably why we have all the paper problems. But this is this is a rare. This is not a mythic. And these are not foils. Nope. At $25. So you're probably onto it. If it can dodge a reprint, if it can dodge a ban and pioneer. I oh, think I, I think the problem is is those are two very big ifs. I think that they are going to liberally reprint. They could, um, but also the, think of it this way too: a Snapcaster is not a thirty-dollar card. It's you know traditionally been a lot more than that. Walking Ballista is a, is the the colorless Snapcaster. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So even if uh, I think it you know it gets banned in Pioneer, I don't think that's really the end of its price point. You know, uh, well, it's, no, I mean, it's 25 26 bucks now, and Pioneer just started. Right. So, I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, granted, yeah, I think it would affect its price a bit, but at the same time, that is just, for the longevity of Magic, going to be an epic two-drop card, you know, and depending on what type of deck you're playing, possibly, you know, less than two mana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Walking Ballistas, last last week it was Dreadheart Ar Arcanist that we talked a lot about, right? Yeah. I, I did pick up a, a play set of those. You mostly did? Mostly because I can't find my play set. <laughs> and I, I want to play Boros Feather and Pioneer. Yep. Um, this week, I'm still I'm still on the Stone Coil Serpent bandwagon. Every time I see one in a trade binder... I'm trying to get it. Like, oh, what's a, this is nothing. Just throw this into this trade. It's like a two, three dollar card. I'm on board with you. With this uh, Stone Coil Serpent is uh, an another much like Walking Ballista, an X spell, but but it only costs one X. Uh, it's an artifact creature, colorless, um, and it comes into play with X one one counters. 
uh, and it has reach, trample, and protection from multicolored. <laughs> it's so for one mana. You could drop this out for one mana. It's a one one with reach, trample, protection from multicolored. You cannot lightning helix this dude. <laughs> you can't lightning helix him. You can't abrupt decay. You can't assassin's trophy. You you can't block with. Uh, you know, in, in standard right now, you can't block with the Minotaur guy. Uh, you, you can't, can't reflector mage it. You can't reflector mage it. Um, a lot of humans are multicolored. Um, you can't block, uh, you know, or you could just infinitely chump many humans. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously there's some that you can't, but, like, just the fact that it can really just dig into a deck like that, you know. And it's uh, a perfect curve fill. Exactly. It's a one drop, it's a three drop, it's a six drop. It always passes the vanilla test plus some. Well, yeah. I mean, so it's it's a per the perfect vanilla creature with reach, trample, and protection. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know, uh, and here's the hidden factor about it that I think makes this card worth a lot more, right? Uh, there's certain colors. When you think about monocolored decks and the things that they struggle with, right? Uh, traditionally, uh, red has been a you know it's been typically a go wide strategy with trample being a harder mechanic to to nail down or any sort of evasiveness besides say like menace or something any sort of evasiveness like flying or trample has really been absent in the mono red decks. This card just goes above and beyond that. It's like I don't care what color you're running. I have trample reach and protection from multicolored, you know, so you could now suddenly be running a red deck and you have a trampler, you have an evasive creature in there. Um, additionally, with, uh, with... Well, think about a mono green deck that's yeah that's going to play a bunch of mana dorks and, and, and ramp up a bunch of mana. They yeah. typically, it's funny you mention that, because green, that you know, if you look at the traditional, classic, you know, ancient style of magic... Green doesn't have a lot of flyers. Green has a lot of flyer hate, you know, such as reach creatures or, you know, hurricane, which deals damage to all flyers. You know, it's because traditionally green has struggled with flying creatures. It can't necessarily block them. It's all big ground creatures. Yeah. So the fact that you can put this in a, a green ramp deck and it suddenly can deal with your flyers, that's so huge. That's so huge. It's a good card. Good it's, pick. It's it's three bucks. The foils, you can actually get foils for the same price as the regular card right now. You're kidding. Uh, no, and this is this is what I was just looking at. So, uh, of course, let me uncheck near mint. Oh, that's... Yeah, look at that. Okay, so like four fifty, three fifteen. what? Right, so... Three dollars, so a dollar fifty. It's a it's a fifty percent markup. Yep, that's interesting. The market price for foils is three thirty five. The market price for normal is three fifteen. But they may be on the way up. Oh, I'm looking at TCG Direct. That's why. Let me uncheck that. Oh, here there we you go. go. Near mint foil, two three bucks. Yep, two ninety nine. I mean, you're you're paying on shipping. Yep, and that's always the case. I try to look at. I mean, there, and that's not just the first one that pops up. There's like three at the top of this that are two ninety nine and, and shipping, yeah. you know, and another one for three twenty, three twenty one. So you can get this card for dirt cheap, man. The regular one is worth three. The foiled one right now is worth three, or you can get it for three. That's a good idea, man. I'm doing that right now. Yeah, uh, it's it's one of those cards that have have your play set. If you if you've got the the cake to to throw down on it. That's the next walking ballista. Like in five years, that'll be a twenty-five dollar card. It's also one that's going to go under the radar with all of these bannings and shit. Like you know, no one's banning that in Pioneer. No. Like you know what I mean? It, that's not getting banned in Pioneer. That's always just going to have straight mad value. You know, that's that's really good. I think that the secret with that card is that to to break it, I think is to add counters after the fact, so you can play it on turn one. Like, you, if you're in a Hardened Scales variant or whatever, and you don't have Hardened Scales on one, you can play this on one. How do you get more counters on it later? And, of course, I know the card that I want to talk about, and I can't think of the name of it. Yeah, it's a jousting, uh, the one no, one for no, one. No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. No. There's there's a green, I want to say it's probably Servant of the drop. Scale. Nope. Nope. It's another new card. This is from, like, Dominaria. 
It's a it's a proliferate card. Ah. It's landfall proliferate. No, for you play land. a land proliferate. So in, in get out of town, man. Uh, yeah. Let's let me look this up, and you go. Yeah, that's investing in that card. I think, especially when the foil is the same price as the as the regular, is just a good idea. I mean. Uh, one thing that I've said about the vanilla test, it can work in the opposite too, right? To tell if a, if a card is broken or mm. if an ability is broken. You know, typically the vanilla test, for those that aren't familiar, is, you know, uh, a 1-1 one, one for 1 is vanilla. A 2-2 two, two for 2 is vanilla, you know, with no abilities. So if a card has any abilities beyond just, you know, its mana cost being equal to its power and toughness... Um, it passes the vanilla test, meaning it has more than just the vanilla two drop or the vanilla one drop. This card always passes the vanilla test, but why I think it might be slightly on the broken side is, like I said, this test can kind of work in reverse to, to check out abilities, right? If you had a 1-1 one, one creature with reach for one, it far, you know, passes the vanilla test. Like, okay, great, yeah. like that's a, a great one drop. Um, if you had a 1-1 one, one for 1 with Trample, sure, it's going to need some stuff, but that passes the vanilla test. Mm -hmm. If you can pump that up, if there was only some way where you could get it to be a higher power, you know, passes the vanilla test. Yeah. If you had a 1-1 one, one for 1 with, with uh, you know, protection from multicolored, it's like, wow, that's really good. I can see that in the sideboard of a lot of decks. Um, putting all those together... Soldier Pantheon. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> like a 2-1 one for, for 1 that has protection from multicolored, yeah. you know... Uh, Sorry. It definitely passes the vanilla test, you know, uh, but, it, you know, to, to really drive that point home and show you, like, some broken abilities that likely won't ever be printed again, uh, Annihilator, for example. Like, you couldn't... You, this is how you tell if an ability is broken. Can I put it on a 1-1 one, one for 1 and have it be fair? And you cannot do that with Annihilator. No. You, you could not have an Annihilator 1-1-1 one, one, one for 1. You know, it's, it's a game ender. Turn 1... The game's literally over. Like, the, you, you either solve this problem or you die. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're sacking a permanent every turn. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. You know, one mana smoke sack. You. Yeah. you know, so, so I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the more abilities you put on a card at, you know, the vanilla mana cost, then the closer to broken it becomes. Because it's almost impossible to see all of the situations that that's really gonna matter in, you know what I mean? And it's like I said with the monocolor decks, there's just certain decks that really need those abilities and yeah. it just pushes it over the top. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're spot on giving a red deck trample, giving a, a, a green deck reach, giving a blue deck protection from multicolor, you know, so I can chump your Bloodbraid Elves all day and you can't abrupt a kid. That's actually a good point. Doing it, on a, <laughs> doing it in a blue deck because they're going to counter the stuff that can target it, and the stuff that can't. Yeah. You know, or, or or you know, the stuff that can actually get through. They're gonna they're gonna uh, you know they're gonna counter the stuff that can hit it, and they're not gonna have to worry about anything else. You, you can't slam down. You know, the multicolored stuff. You can't hit it with some of the most popular removal spells, and anything you can hit it with they can have the, the mana to counter it or the spells to counter it. So that's a, that's a very good point. But So the card you were talking about is Evolution Sage. Yeah. And it is a 3-2 for 3 mana, so almost passes the vanilla test just on the mana cost. Uh, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, proliferate. Yeah, that's really friggin' good. Play a dork on one. Play your, your Stone Coil Serpent for uh, 3 on turn 2. On turn three, you play this guy in your... Fetch land turn? or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Terramorphic Expanse. <laughs> Especially now, now if your dork is a, is a noble hierarch, and if we're talking about modern, you know, oh my God. swinging for five or six with trample. And can you imagine playing against humans at that point? Like, <laughs> That's really bad. That's I mean, it's hard for them to deal with that. You know, just a big body right there that they can't bounce, they can't, you know... Exile, yeah. they can't all of their spells to deal with it. Yeah. Most you of them just are multi yeah. You can't. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think any human player wants to go back to playing. Uh, what are the other 
fiend hunter variants. Oh you no, know, not you at don't want to play a mono white. I mean, even the early versions of humans ran the uh, the guy on the sideboard that destroyed an artifact when he came into play, but he was multicolored. Yeah. yeah, you know, it, even that can't deal with it. Like you know, Quasali Pride Mage can't deal with it. Like, what are you gonna do? Bring in Kataki Wars Mage against this thing? Like, there's really nothing. Like, there's no good way to to go about it. Um, but yeah, th that's uh, the Evolution Sage with that card is just, I can't believe that isn't played more in Standard right now. Well, and, and you totally made me think of, uh, thinking about blue decks. We have Essence, is it Essence Capture that will put a plus one, plus one counter on your creature and counter another creature? There's there's a counter wow. spell in Standard right now that's like, yes. put a plus one, plus one counter on your creature. I think, you I think you're right, Essence Capture. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it does, uh, yeah, basically what its name suggests. Uh, the Essence Scatter is it counters a creature skill, a spell, Essence Capture. Hey, it's basically capturing some of the essence of that creature, putting a 1-1 one, one counter on up to one target creature you control, counter target creature spell. Yeah, Essence Capture. For two blue mana, it's an instant. Yeah, that's insane. Like, that's, there like, you go. I'm like, going to play this for on one for one, pass the turn. Yep. Oh, you wanted to play a dude? No. But now I'm going to swing with a 2-2. Yep. See you next turn. <laughs> <laughs> when I play my Evolution Sage. Oh my god. And can you imagine, too, like, you know, if you if you take that tempo style, right, um, and played it in a format where Oko was legal. Blech. You know, uh, how stupid is that, man? You, like, you could play that in Modern right now. I'm not suggesting this would be a good deck, but, you know, think of these, just all of these cool interactions with this card. It just plays very well with all of these awesome cards that are already well, out there. And like Walking Blister, it just doesn't ask much from you. Tap mana, good card. Right. That's exactly how this is. Uh, anything else you're looking at, value-wise? Things people should be... Anything from the spoiler that's say, triggering for you, buy, buy this card now, because looking at the spoilers... Well, I'll tell you, uh, there was one other one that popped out to me this week. It, it uh, appeared in, no surprise, a vintage tournament. I love keeping an eye on those. Uh, and it is legal in modern. Um, and it's only a $2 card right now. It's called Trade Roots. And uh, what it is, is it's a two-drop enchantment for blue. Uh, one blue, one colorless. Uh, it's an enchantment. just sits there in play um, and has two abilities that are extremely odd. Like, you know what I mean? Just really rare abilities. Uh, they're both for one mana. All you have to do is pay one mana. The first one just says, pay one, return target land you control to its owner's hand. So you can uh, aboro Palace in the Clouds any land. Um... The other ability is pay one, discard a land card, draw a card. So the reason this is used in Vintage is obviously because of the unbanning, the recent unbanning or, or unrestricting of Fast Bond. You know, uh, if you slam a card like Retreat to Hagra in there, you know, you can, once you have those two out uh, with Fast Bond, it's, uh, it's just good night. Like, you know, it's game over right there. Um, but also, you know, it, the, the way vintage decks work is these cards also have to be have value in some other way in the deck, you know. Um, and Retreat to Hagra is just weird. It's one of those cards that most vintage players don't prepare for, you know. Um, and they they run for a Boro Palace in the Clouds in this deck with uh, with Retreat to Hagra. Retreat to Hagra is a three drop enchantment. Has landfall. Uh, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Um, it has two abilities, but you're only choosing one in this deck, and it is each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. So Fast Bond is an enchantment for one that lets you play any number of lands in the course of a turn uh, at the cost of one life per, uh, per land after the first one you play. So I can play an infinite amount of lands with Fast Bond. Um, if you have them in your hand. Yep, if I have them in my hand. So what I do is, you kind of see where this is going, fast bond, play a land, pay the mana, bounce it, play it again, bounce it, play it again, bounce it, and I just am always maintaining the same life total while nipping my opponent down. Um, they, like I said, also run for a Boro Palace in the clouds in here, so it looks like that's literally a strategy. This is just, the strategy of this deck is just, you know, counter everything your opponent's doing very efficiently through Force of Will, through Fluster Storms, Mental Missteps, and then just play Boro Palace in the Clouds and Retreat to Hagra, or if you're lucky, Fast Bond and Retreat to Hagra, and just ping them down. So why are you on Trade Roots and not Retreat to Hagra? So uh, tr Retreat to Hagra was an uncommon um, 
and printed in a recent set. Uh, it was the PFC, I think. Yes, uh, it was the. Yeah. Battle for Zendikar. Battle for Zendikar. That's what it is. Uh, and, you know, that is... It, it, it's an uncommon... There's a ton of them out there in collections that I buy. There's always just so many of them. Like, great. But the real enabler with this that just... I looked at the card and I said, that's just really odd that there's a card that does that kind of stuff, uh, is Trade Roots. You know, and if you think about it for something other than just this deck, right? Um, you know, not only does it, it turn... Uh, all of your your land drops into a Boro Palace in the clouds in this you know controly mill deck and vintage, but just think about this in Commander. Like, why don't more people use that in Commander? I mean, you know, you can discard a land draw card. Think about it. There's a ton of lands that people just jam in their deck because they have cool enter the battlefield abilities, like uh, Bajuka Bog. Yeah, you First know what one I mean. That came to mind. You know, something like that where you could just. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to do it again. Like, bounce it, drop it down again. I want to reset my Vivid Land or yep, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, or, you know, hey, um, you know, how about this one? You could you could lay down City of Traders, uh, you know, and then the next turn, pay City of Traders, use one to return it, drop it down again, pay, you know, and you could use it as a mana boost to that card, you know. Um, uh, activate Nekthos. Bounce Nekthos. <laughs> oh my <laughs> god, yeah. Nekthos. There's that too. Gaia's Cradle. Like, oh yeah, all of the lands that, you know, that produce multiple uh, mana. This does not work with it's lum it lum writes a bit Lamont. <laughs> <laughs> yep, do don't not, bounce that to your hand. Don't try that, folks. But, uh, you know, but also, just for like the, the card uh, advantage here, you know, you you have to discard, pay one and discard a land card, but you draw a card. Like, it just helps you filter your draws, man. And, you know, especially in those grindy commander max matches, how often do you draw the land and you're like, damn it, now I gotta wait for my turn to come back around, I got nothing to do. Yeah. It just allows everything you. everything cycling. Yeah, exactly. It gives everything cycling, man. You can literally, and you can do it right before your next turn, you can cycle out a few lands after you drop that, you can do it in response. The good thing about that ability is people don't know what you have in your hand at that point. Mm -hmm. So it, they, they're they not going to be too anxious to go get rid of it. You know what I mean? It, because they could just get taken on value right there. So it it's one of those enchantments. It's not too threatening in and of itself. It's going to stay in play. And it's just got some really cool value to it. So there's two printings that are modern legal. I mean, there's two printings in the modern era, 8th and 9th. Mm -hmm. Uh, for those of you that like a black bordered card, <laughs> you can get it without going way back in time. <laughs> yes. Uh, and what are these going for? Uh, well, the Mercedian Masks version right now, which is the the non foil black border, is I believe like four dollars. Uh, the eighth and ninth edition white bordered cards are about two bucks. You can get them for two two fifty online, um, but any of the foil versions are like forty or fifty plus. And yeah. so this is one of those scenarios where you can tell from the foil version that people that are playing this card will pay for this card because they know that it's worth the play. The play value is there. Right. The, so the foil probably suggests that maybe some people are playing it in Commander and there's not many out there that are foil. You know what yeah. I mean? Now, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta say, Mercedian? What did I say? Mercedian? Oh, Yeah. Fun fact, that was the first set that I started playing in, was Mercadian Masks. And some people call it Mercadian. Yeah. I say, this. Is, look, it's a mercenary set, okay? It's a mercenary set. Okay. There's a ton of, like, you know, mercenaries in it. Literally a card, a creature type called Mercenary. Okay. I don't get why people call it Mercadian Masks. It's Mercadian, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that, get it. That right there was worth the price of the folks. Um... All right, I got one spicy thing to, to throw in today. What you got? I heard this mentioned, and I will give credit where credit is due. Uh, Ruben Bressel mentioned this in the Magic Mike's podcast that came out earlier today. And it was just like, he just said these two words at the end of their podcast. They didn't go into it. Rampaging Ferocidon, Torbran, Thane of Redfell. Okay. Remind me of what Torbrand does again. Torbrand is a 2-4. Whenever a red source you control would deal damage, it deals that much plus 2. Oh my god. Rampaging Ferocidon, and, and I, I gotta look this up, but from my recollection, it's a 3-drop that says, 
Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, deal one damage to that creature's it, it, controller. Yep. Damage can't be prevented, or no, players can't gain life. I don't know about the damage. Yep, it's, it's, it's a three drop, three two. Players can't gain life. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield uh, under an opponent's control, it deals them it one damage. player's control. So uh, it yes, will damage it you as well. Correct. Uh, players can't gain life, so it doesn't prevent damage. Okay. I'm going to play this on three, that guy on four. Do you want to get a bolt for every time you play a creature? God, that's so bad. God, that's so bad, man. There's a there's a player at our, at our local gaming store that does these odd versions of uh, burn decks that has classically used Rampaging Frostodon. To great effect. Oh, to great effect. And, you know, in with uh, Torbrand's appearance in some standard decks recently, yeah. he is a good card, too, in and of himself. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some experimental decks on the horizon like this. That's that's huge, man. Uh, I mean, then you could get slammed up against a deck that that don't give a shit though. Like, like, it well, okay, so so here's the thing though: when you're playing, you're still playing a red deck, and you're still playing with creatures. So this is your three drop and your four drop. What are, what are your one drops and your two drops? You know, if your one drops and two drops are still soul scar mages and monastery swift spears and uh, you're playing the 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 new adventure spell that's got a damage can't be prevented shock attached to it. That's pretty good. Maybe your one drop is that snake coil guy. <laughs> maybe your one drop is stone cold serpent. Stone cold serpent. Yes. Ah, uh, maybe maybe your five drop is clack bridge troll, oh and you give God. your opponent three <laughs> goats, and you zap them for oh, nine. Oh, there's a better one. There's one in red that does that, too. It's a it's like a 5-5 five, five dragon, I believe, and gives, like, four creatures to your opponent. Oh, that's stupid. So, so yeah, I mean, this is this is absolute Timmy nonsense, but they're... they're... Torbrand seeing play in, in standard and some pioneer red decks. For Rampaging Ferocidon was banned. It's, the card, I mean, people joke that it was banned for, for the sins of other cards. <laughs> but but there's a reason why that card was banned. And I'll tell you what, nobody's going to want to bring black-white tokens back up. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> when they know. Brad, this is insane. I can't believe you brought this up. Now hear me out with this. Uh, Final Fortune in a deck like that, right? With uh, maybe even potentially you throw one or two of uh, Sundial of the Infinite. Uh, Final Fortune says two mana, red spell, two red. Take an extra turn after this one. At the end of that turn, you lose the game. Um, and Sundial of the Infinite is a two drop artifact. Pay one, end the turn. Um, it, play this only on your turn. Um, so you could have that little combo in there. You could throw the, the Sundial of the Infinite in for these creatures that just give your opponents creatures that are just busted for their mana cost. And when they have that enter the battlefield effect, you just end the turn with Sundial of the Infinite and they never get the creatures. Um, or you just run Final Fortune, where when you have these nasty dudes like Ferostodon on the battlefield and they're not playing creatures, the board's wide open, you crack in with, you know, Tormod or, or uh, Torbrand. Torbrand and Ferostodon. That's and seven just, damage. Yep. And then oh, you're no. just like. I'm yep. sorry, that's five, six, seven, eight. that's nine damage. Yep. If you're, if well, you're seven with... damage, right? Because he's a two four. So and... he does four. Yep. Oh, because he's a red source too. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Nine damage right there. And then you just play, yep, Final Fortune, I'm just going to do it again. What are you going to so do? So here's the thing. If you could actually swing in, like, with anything on turn one or two, they have to kill that. You play the Ferocidon. Then you play this guy. If you hit them, they're, they're, they're in bolt range, effectively, because a bolt does five damage. Oh, my God. Wow. Oh, hold on. Wow. Can, what, what can we do? You know? Wow. Can we... That's and, and of course, I'm 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 high on Pioneer. I'm high on the, the brewability of it. I, I again listening to some other podcasters talk about recent online Pioneer leagues with 1,100 players in the league, like Pioneers jamming, and people are preparing yeah. for these Magic Fest and GPS, uh, the the professional tour events that are gonna be Pioneer next year. So mm -hmm. I'm I am. 
I have no fear about investing in that format for sure. Oh, for sure, man. Like, the, you know, it's still very volatile. It's still very questionable about what its future is going to be. You know, some speculate that it's going to be great. It, you know, like you had mentioned, it's going to be the next big eternal format that will hopefully outlast the ages unlike you know uh and not we may not necessarily need another eternal format to be introduced you know some people like myself might remain skeptical about the you well, know the okay. future of pioneer but at the same time regardless it's a great investment opportunity right now and if in nine years or ten years they come out with a you know post post pioneer modern 2.0 or whatever it'll just be another opportunity exactly if, if, if they get to that point, then more people are still playing the game, and the cards that I've sat on for years and didn't have the gumption to buy list will be worth even more. Exactly. So, uh, three big points from today's show. Your card, Snake Coil... Stone Coil... Stone, God damn it. I'm, I'm going to get that name right before I buy them, but <laughs> Snake Coil... Stone Coil Serpent. Fun, stone... <laughs> Wait, tell me, it's Snake Coil Stone Forger. <laughs> snake, <laughs> snake Root Trade Forger. That guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trade Roots. Trade Roots. Uh, and the other one is Walking Ballista. Man, that's uh, still still going hard on that card. I don't think it's done climbing in price. And uh, and uh, before before I make Rampaging for us at On Spike, make sure you get your copies. <laughs> well said. Well uh, said. See you next week. See you next week, brother. <laughs>